We are thrilled to host the second Tar Heel Three Minute Thesis Competition. 10 students representing 10 institutions across North Carolina are competing today. It's exciting to hear from our best and brightest scholars from different disciplines sharing their innovative research, all of which can be impactful to North Carolina added citizens. And join me in thanking Burroughs Welcome Fund for sponsoring and supporting this event. Good afternoon. My name is Suzanne Barbour and I'm the Dean of the Graduate School at UNC Chapel Hill. And I want to welcome you to the Tar Heel Three Minute Thesis Competition. Developed by the University of Queensland in 2008, the Three Minute Thesis Competition is an academic competition that's held worldwide in um, over 900 universities in over 85 countries around the world. And it's meant as an opportunity for graduate students to hone their communication skills. Today we are thrilled to have graduate students from around the state of North Carolina participating in this, the second annual Tar Heel Three Minute Thesis Competition. In a few minutes, 10 graduate students from institutions around our state will have three minutes and one static slide to describe their very important work and its impact on our state, on our state and beyond. As such, this is an opportunity for our graduate students to hone their elevator pitch, and that's a skill set that's going to serve them well no matter what career path they choose. It's also an opportunity for us to showcase the important work that graduate students do around our state. By the way, this is Graduate Education Week in North Carolina. It's a week of advocacy and opportunities for residents of the state of North Carolina and the leadership of our state to meet our graduate students, learn about their important work, and learn about, about its importance and, and impact on our state. And the Tar Heel Three Minute Thesis Competition is just one of the activities that's going on around the state this week. This annual event would not be possible without the generous support of the Burroughs Welcome Fund and the North Carolina Council of Graduate Schools. And I want to thank them very much for their support, their interest, and their advocacy in favor of our graduate students here in the state of North Carolina. I also want to thank the panel that judged the, the entrance, such, whose videos you'll see in just a few minutes. I want to thank the North Carolina Council of Graduate Schools leadership for supporting this event. And I want to thank our communications director, Elizabeth Poindexter, for publicizing this event and um, bringing you here today. And a big, big shout out to Brian Rabarsik. He's the Associate Dean for Professional Development and Funding in the Graduate School at UNC Chapel Hill. Thank you, Brian, for organizing this event. Graduate students around our state are at the forefront of the, re the important research that's done in our state. But the most important part of it of all is when that research becomes real to the people who are impacted by it. And that's what the Tar Heel Three Minute Thesis Competition is all about. And so sit back, relax, enjoy the presentations you're about to see. But before that, I'd like to introdu introduce you to last year's Three Minute Thesis Competition winner so she can give you her sense of the importance of this competition. Thank you for being here today, and I hope you enjoy the event. Hi, my name is Meredith Hovis, and I'm a recent graduate from the College of Natural Resources at NC State University. If you're a graduate student working on a dissertation or thesis, maybe you have felt like it's been difficult to explain your research project to your friends or family members. Or maybe you feel like you would completely bore someone about your very niche research topic. Both of these feelings were very true for me. But the three minute thesis competition allowed me to take my four year research project onto a digestible scale that was easy to comprehend. The experience also gave me the confidence to speak about my work in a way that engaged the audience. Hi, I'm Catherine Hall Hertel. I'm an associate dean in the graduate school here at UNC Charlotte. At UNC Charlotte, we train our graduate students to be the leaders of tomorrow. We know that their research will have a real impact on their communities and make a difference in people's lives. So it's really important that our students learn how to convey the importance of their research. The 3MT gives us an opportunity to help them learn these skills. They learn how to talk to the public, to talk to the press, and maybe even funding agencies. So we think it's a terrific event. It's really been a difference maker for us and um, we hope it expands. Leah Clark, Environmental Sciences and Engineering, University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Eating for Two, the role of maternal diet in protecting against arsenic-associated lower birth weight. While much about childbirth seems magical, it's actually a tightly regulated process. During the first weeks of pregnancy, finger-like projections emerge from a ball of cells that will go on to form the embryo. 
These finger-like projections invade the wall of the uterus to form the placenta, connecting the baby's umbilical cord to its mother's blood supply. I know what you might be thinking, that sounds like a parasite, but proper placental invasion is critical to fetal growth because it allows for the transfer of oxygen and nutrients. Despite these features, the placenta is somewhat of a double-edged sword, also transferring toxic chemicals circulating in the mother's blood. My research aims to protect developing babies from a particularly harmful chemical, arsenic. Arsenic is a cancer-causing chemical typically found in contaminated drinking water. It's known as the king of poisons and the poison of kings because it's been implicated in several murders throughout the Middle Ages. More recently, maternal arsenic exposure has been associated with lower birth weight in several research studies. This is concerning because low birth weight is associated with infant mortality and an increased risk of heart disease later in life. As seen in my slide, arsenic hinders the placenta's ability to invade the wall of the uterus, constricting the flow of blood and nutrients. Fortunately, arsenic metabolism relies on folate and other B vitamins we typically consume in our diets anyways. Among adults, B vitamin supplementation has been shown to improve the body's ability to remove arsenic and protect against arsenic-induced diseases. My research will evaluate whether these vitamins also protect developing babies from the harms of arsenic exposure. To test this, I'll use a unique data set collected from women who were exposed to arsenic during pregnancy. Using statistical modeling approaches, I'll evaluate whether the negative association between maternal arsenic exposure and infant birth weight is attenuated or completely diminished by higher levels of B vitamins. So far, I've seen significant differences in birth weight according to B12 status, which implies that there is an effect by maternal diet on the association between arsenic exposure and infant birth weight. I'm so excited to complete this work as part of my dissertation because it has global implications. Around the world, hundreds of millions are exposed to arsenic through contaminated drinking water. This includes people living in my home state, North Carolina, where arsenic has been measured in private well water at levels exceeding government regulations. My research aims to protect one of the most vulnerable groups and could inform the dietary recommendations made to pregnant women. In fact, it just might change the meaning of the phrase, eating for two. Thank you. Brianna Cook, Biology, Appalachian State University. What's the buzz? Understanding Southern Appalachian bumblebee biometrics. When you think of pollinators, what comes to mind? Probably not the serious decline that they are experiencing. Bees are facing numerous threats, including pesticide exposure, altered and damaged habitats, loss of resources, competition, and ultimately climate change. Bumblebees are really important pollinators because they're responsible for the vitality of native plant communities. However, they've been in decline for the past 20 years. Some species are in extreme peril with decline rates upwards of 90%. Native bees are valuable both ecologically and economically, and the U.S. relies on them for pollination, which is valued at over $9 billion annually. Bumblebees specifically have longer tongues, increased wing vibrations, and they can forage in unfavorable weather, making them a really efficient pollinator. And despite all of this increased awareness of the importance of bees, scientists are still working to learn basic aspects of their biology. My research focuses on biometrics, which is the quantification of ecologically important traits, including both body size and tongue length. These traits are important in determining other aspects of the bee's life history, such as their energy expenditures, foraging distances, and their ability to extract food rewards. It's not only important to understand these biometrics, but also think and look at how their environment can alter them. For my study, samples were collected during a citizen science pollinator inventory, and this was coordinated in 2019 along the entire length of the Blue Ridge Parkway in collaboration with the National Park Service. This novel inventory lasted March through October, and the mega transect allows for variation in both floral diversity, abundance, elevation, and seasonal variation. Currently, I've measured all these biometrics, and I plan to statistically compare these variances with these traits among species to understand if it's more fixed or variable. Implications of body size and tongue length are really important. For example, bumblebee foraging distance is directly related to population dynamics, genetics, and life history, as the larger the bee body size is, the longer foraging distances it can actually take. Consequences of disturbed bee foraging distance include reduced pollination for plants, predation, parasitism, 
decreased nutrient transfer, as well as a decrease in C dispersal. Tongue length indicates a dietary preference as individuals with longer tongues can access different floral resources. Bumblebee tongue lengths have been shown to have an evolutionary sensitivity to the abundance of floral resources with fewer, shorter tongues and a more generalized foraging niche. Having an inventory and analysis of North Carolina native bees will help to allow for better conservation and protection for them because we simply cannot protect what we do not know is present. My study will help to understand how the environment can influence North Carolina bumblebee biometrics without having these diverse physical traits within bumblebees, flower abundance and diversity is at risk of declining. Such data also provides opportunities to forecast whether and how organisms will be vulnerable to climbing climate change, and this provides a baseline for documenting such changes should they occur in future populations. Emily Deem, Biology, Western Carolina University. Chilled to the bone, comparing four DNA extraction methods for solving cold cases. You may have heard of investigative genetic genealogy, or IGG, associated with the Golden State Killer's arrest in 2018. This new technique has become a rapidly popular tool in forensics for solving cold cases. Not only can IgG be used to identify the perpetrators of a crime, like with the Golden State Killer, it can also be used to identify the remains of missing people. In the US, there are tens of thousands of unidentified human remains. In North Carolina alone, there are over 120 individuals' remains yet to be identified. The first step in IgG is to extract enough DNA from the samples in order to successfully amplify and sequence the DNA for identification purposes. For my project, I focus on DNA extraction from bone samples. DNA extraction is arguably the most important step in DNA analysis. It directly limits what you're able to do in later steps, which makes it a crucial area of research, especially when you're dealing with samples like bone. Extracting DNA from bone presents an interesting problem. The reason that DNA can persist in bones for an extremely long time is also the reason that DNA is hard to extract. The web-like matrix in bones holds DNA tightly, so DNA extraction methods must be tough enough to release the DNA from the bone, but gentle enough to not break down the very fragile DNA. In general, forensic extraction methods aim for longer strands of DNA, which aren't always available in cold case bone samples, where skeletal remains are exposed to harsh environments that break down DNA. Specifically for IgG, very short strands are actually more useful. This is where I got the idea to use extraction methods from the field of ancient DNA. Scientists in this field are able to extract tiny pieces of DNA from bone samples that are a million years old. Which brings me to my study question. Are ancient DNA or forensic DNA extraction methods more appropriate for cold case bone samples when using techniques for identification like investigative genetic genealogy? For my project, I compared one ancient and three forensic DNA extraction methods on seven bone samples. After I extracted the DNA, I analyzed the amount and the quality of DNA that I got from the samples and compared across methods to see which performed the best. And I saw that the ancient DNA method performed the best, followed closely by a forensic method. These methods gave me the most well-rounded information that would be the most useful in an investigation. The results also showed that an ancient method could be useful in context in forensic context with IgG. In North Carolina, IgG has helped solve several cold cases, including the identification of the remains of an infant found over 30 years ago. In the US, IgG has helped solve over 200 cases. That's 200 victims and families that now have answers. My research showed that collaboration between the ancient and forensic DNA fields can be beneficial. I hope that my research contributes to the growing knowledge of forensic techniques for identifying skeletal remains and solving cold cases. Richmond Georg Benno, Applied Science and Technology, North Carolina Agricultural and Technical State University. Apple flavonoid, Floritin, prevents or reduces the risk of some chronic diseases. Can the flavonoid in apple prevent or reduce the risk of chronic diseases? Perhaps. The food you see on the left side of the screen is part of your diet. But what if I tell you today that most processed foods are unhealthy because they are a major source of some dangerous chemicals known as reactive carbonyl species, RCS. When RCS are present in the body, they react and modify biomolecules like proteins, amino acids, DNAs, and lipids. This leads to pathogenesis like age-related diseases, cancers, diabetes, and kidney disease. On the other hand, the food you see on the right side of the screen, green leafy fruits and vegetables are healthy 
because they are a major source of secondary metabolites known as dietary flavonoids. In the case of an apple, it contains a flavonoid known as fluoretin. An apple fluoretin offers cytoprotection to your body by shielding your biomolecules from the attack of these dangerous LCS. This prevent or reduce chronic diseases. In my research, I conduct in vitro chemical reactions and I use all forms of analytical techniques and chemistry to demonstrate how apple flavonoid fluoretin can trap the most dangerous LCS known as 4-HNE. 4-HNE is a major biomarker of lipid peroxidation, which has been implicated in a number of diseases like cancers, obesity, and diabetes. The results of my experiment clearly indicates that apple flavonoid fluoretin can trap 4-HNE by forming stable conjugates with them that are no more harmful to the body. More interestingly, in a human studies, when human volunteers were made to eat a number of apples and their urine sample collected and tested, it was clearly evident that apple flavonoid fluoretin maintains its trapping ability of the dangerous 4-HNE in vivo when apples are consumed. The findings of this study clearly helps us to understand how dietary flavonoids and consuming fruits and vegetables can prevent chronic diseases. According to a data published in 2020 by the North Carolina Diabetes Advisory Council, 1.3 million of us already have diabetes. This is 12.5% of our population, and this number is expected to increase. People of North Carolina, join me and let us begin to make simple decisions concerning our diets. Of course, I am not a dietitian, and diet is not the only factor, but empirical evidence from my research must clearly advise you that the next time you are choosing a diet for yourself, go in for the green leafy fruits and vegetables, especially include some apples to enjoy a quality of life devoid of painful sicknesses. Remember, an apple a day will keep the doctor away, but the choice is yours to make. Thank you. Emma Erickson, Counseling, University of North Carolina at Pembroke. Stepping outside the office, benefits and limitations of walk and talk therapy. Walk and talk therapy is an emerging approach to traditional counseling that integrates outdoor physical activity with traditional talk therapy. As a counselor in training, I wanted to examine the research on its benefits, limitations, and accessibility in order to better serve the clients in my community. Walk and talk therapy harnesses the therapeutic benefits of walking in nature. Walking in nature has been shown to increase self-esteem, elevate mood, and decrease symptoms of anxiety and depression. Studies have found that it can also strengthen mind-body connection and help people achieve a greater overall sense of well-being. Research shows that integrating exercise into therapy can assist clients in problem solving by promoting psychological processing, helping clients to feel unstuck. Studies indicate that combining walking with therapy teaches clients that walking can be utilized as a self-care tool, and it illustrates the benefits of self-care. Walk and talk therapy also helps build therapeutic rapport faster. Therapists have found that walking side by side in a neutral space levels the power differential within the therapeutic relationship and helps clients open up more. It's also especially appealing for clients who are intimidated by a formal face-to-face -face clinical setting. Additionally, therapists using walk and talk therapy reported feeling personally invigorated and even reduced their own stress levels along the way. This points to the possibility of using walk and talk therapy for both client benefit and clinician self-care. There are some limitations to walk and talk therapy. Research on this approach noted that the biggest drawbacks are uncertain weather, safety, and limitations to confidentiality when in public spaces. Secondly, there is limited counselor education in the area of walk and talk therapy, raising questions about the ethics of this method. Before adding walk and talk therapy to their counseling toolbox, clinicians should have an open discussion with their clients about the limitations of confidentiality when outdoors. It's also important for therapists to consult their licensing board, lawyer, and malpractice insurance provider. Lastly, counselors should consider seeking supervision from experienced walk and talk therapists. Walk and talk therapy is still a niche within the counseling field and clients have limited access. After conducting a review of services offered by 70 counseling practices in the New Hanover County area, 
I found that only two offered walk and talk therapy. Although there are some limitations to consider, there are tremendous advantages of incorporating this modality into clinical practice. It's possible that clients in our region could be better served if therapists consider stepping out of the office and into nature. Thank you. Sam Hall, Integrated Toxicology and Environmental Health, Duke University, Finding Forever Chemicals in North Carolina, Characterizing PFAS Pollution. Let's talk about forever chemicals in North Carolina. Forever chemicals, or PFAS, are a huge group of chemicals that are very stable and very persistent due to their chemical structure. Many PFAS don't naturally break down in the environment. They can last essentially forever. That stability, though, makes these chemicals very useful, so they've been put in lots of products. Pretty much any product that's waterproof, stainproof, or nonstick likely has a PFAS in it. So your rain jacket, your nonstick cookware, even your takeout food containers likely have PFAS in them. The EPA estimates that there's over 12,000 different PFAS chemicals now. So then why do we care about all these chemicals that don't break down? One reason is because we're detecting them in us. PFAS can be found in the blood of nearly every single person in the United States. We can even detect PFAS in newborn babies and then breast milk, meaning that future generations are being exposed to these chemicals too. And in addition to detecting them in us, we have evidence that PFAS may be harm causing harmful health effects. Some PFAS have been associated with kidney and testicular cancer, with increased cholesterol, and with reproductive effects. Unfortunately, with 12,000 different chemicals though, many of them haven't been studied. So we don't yet know if they could be toxic or harmful to people. In our own backyard, PFAS are a big issue in North Carolina specifically. Our lab and others have found that PFAS contaminates surface water across the state. Gen X is just one example of a PFAS that is contaminating our rivers. Unfortunately, once PFAS are in the river, it can't be filtered out with standard drinking water treatment. So PFAS go from the river to drinking water and into our bodies. So then what do we do about this issue? The first step is to get better information. My research focuses on exposure to PFAS. I can use analytical chemistry techniques to measure what kinds of PFAS are in our environment and at what amounts. We can learn what PFAS are in the water that we're drinking or in the dust that we're breathing in our homes. We can test our blood and even tissues like the placenta to learn what kinds of PFAS are accumulating inside of our bodies. And then we can go even further and ask questions about health effects. One result already from our lab was that one specific PFAS chemical was associated with decreased birth weight in the North Carolina population. This research will help us to learn what PFAS we should study more or how we should use and regulate PFAS. And ultimately, this research will help us make better, safer decisions about PFAS in North Carolina. Thank you. Samantha Harvey, Criminal Justice, Fayetteville State University. Law Enforcement Attitudes Toward the Implementation of an Animal Offender Registry in the Cape Fear Region. Animals are a part of our lives, whether they live with us or not. If you don't have a dog or cat at home, look at social media to see cute pictures of pets or read a billboard on the highway encouraging you to adopt, not shop. But for all the positive images of animals in our society, there is a dark side to the lives of our animals, one that we can no longer ignore. Consider this. On average, one animal is abused per minute, and animal cruelty is an underreported crime. Most animals suffering while you watch this presentation won't be rescued from the abuse, the neglect, and the fear that they are experiencing. Just as I don't want a fellow human being to suffer, I do not want any living creature to suffer from unjust and unnecessary pain. And according to research I recently conducted here in North Carolina, our law enforcement officers agree. We have offender registries designed to protect our children from predators, but animals, who are also often unable to defend themselves, have no such protection. Animal offender registries exist in New York and Illinois counties, and in the state of Tennessee, and need to be given further consideration at county, state, and national levels to protect the animals under our collective care. 
Throughout 2021, I conducted research with New Hanover County Sheriff's Office in which almost 100 officers, both experienced and not in animal cruelty cases, were surveyed to determine support for an animal offender registry. Across both groups, support was found for an animal offender registry as an effective law enforcement tool to protect our animals, with high regard given to animal sentience, comfort, and safety. Law enforcement is willing to find and support concrete solutions, such as registries, to protect animals in our society, and we need to take our cue from those who protect and serve. A bill to establish a statewide registry for animal offenders was introduced in 2019, but didn't pass at that time. This research shows that an animal offender registry should be revisited as a state issue. I understand the topic of animal welfare might fade into the background at a time when we are witnessing war carried out between countries, division based on politics, race, and gender, and stress from inflation or fear of recession. However, let us all be reminded by the great Betty White, how we treat our animals is a true measure of our humanity and morality. We cannot take care of one another if we are unwilling to take care of those who depend on us for love, for safety, and for their well-being. Establishing an offender registry and working hand in hand with the law enforcement officers who support such a tool are small tasks to undertake to insulate animals from cruelty and neglect, nurturing a healthier and a happier world for everyone who inhabits our precious planet. Thank you. Leisha Rouse, Nursing, East Carolina University, Wounds You Can't See. Breaking news. There's been another school shooting. COVID rates are steadily climbing. Children's mental health is being affected by COVID restrictions. These are just a few examples of trauma that children between the ages of zero and 17 may be exposed to, referred to as adverse childhood experiences or ACEs. Adverse childhood experiences have been actually shown to change the physical as well as the chemical makeup of the brain. It's been linked to risky behaviors, chronic diseases, and ultimately premature death. However, the good news is adverse childhood experiences can be mitigated through caring, nurturing, trusting relationships. Trauma-informed care is an approach to trauma. It's composed of four key areas. One, it acknowledges the presence of trauma in society. Two, it realizes the impact of trauma on health. Three, it seeks to integrate trauma knowledge into policies, procedures, and practices. And four, it aims to prevent re-traumatization. And because children spend approximately 32 hours a week in schools, and school nurses are the only healthcare professionals in schools, school nurses are ideally positioned to be effective members of the trauma-informed care team. However, there's little to no research in this area. My study explored the school nurses' knowledge, experiences, and role in trauma-informed care in school health practice. I surveyed 165 North Carolina school nurses via an online survey using REDCAP, which is a secure online server, and is HIPAA and FERPA compliant. I recruited the school nurses through the North Carolina School Nurse Association and through snowball sampling. My findings indicated that ACEs are indeed prevalent in North Carolina schools, that school nurses feel unprepared to provide trauma-informed care to children, and that, they, that school nurses identified the most significant barrier to providing trauma-informed care as time constraints. One of my main goals through this study is to encourage school nurses to view all children through a trauma-informed lens, to no longer ask the question, what's wrong with you, but to transform their thinking and ask what has happened to you. Thank you. Amanda Sargent, Software and Information Systems, University of North Carolina at Charlotte. What is it about who you know that matters? race and gender bias and employee referral programs. It's not what you know, it's who you know. 
Our parents have said it, our teachers have said it. Hey, maybe we've even said it to emphasize just how important networking is to getting a job or getting ahead. But what is it about who we know that gives us that special boost? Well, my research examines one process in organizations related to how who you know can help or hurt your workplace success, employee referral programs. Employee referral programs incentivize current employees to recommend someone from outside of an organization for an open job role, and I think these programs may be accidentally introducing both race and gender bias into hiring. Here's why. We know from prior research that applicant names at the top of a resume can lead hiring managers to infer the race and gender of that applicant, and that these inferences in turn can trigger implicit biases, leading hiring managers to evaluate equally qualified candidates differently, often resulting in women and people of color being evaluated less favorably compared to men and white applicants. So if applicant names at the top of a page can lead to these different evaluations, then might not also the name of the referring employee, which is usually visible on an application, do the same thing? I think it can. Well, so to test this idea, I've run an experiment where I've asked experienced hiring managers to evaluate the resumes of four hypothetical job applicants. Now, I've removed the names of the applicants from the top of the page, and while each of the documents looks different, they're actually the same in terms of quality. The only difference between the resumes is the name of the referring employee placed at the top of the page and selected to signal that this person is either a white man, a black man, a white woman, or a black woman. Now, this research is still in progress, but I've conducted a pilot test and here's what I found so far. While all of the applicants were evaluated essentially the same in terms of competence and commitment, certain applicants were more likely to be recommended for interviews than others based on the race and gender of the person that referred them. So people referred by men and white applicants tended to receive the highest recommendations for interviews, while people referred by black women specifically received the lowest. Now what this research suggests is that that thing about who we know that matters, at least in employee referral programs, may just be the race and gender of the person that referred you. And if that's the case, then these really popular programs are introducing bias into hiring. But there's hope. When we identify sites of inequality in organizations, we can begin to strategize solutions. Organizations can use my research to evaluate their practices and take action to ensure that all people are given an equal shot at getting the job and getting ahead. Thank you. Shohanuzaman Shohan, Industrial and Systems Engineering, North Carolina State University, Solving Human Organ Development Challenges. Every day, 17 people die in this country while waiting to get an organ transplant. Every nine minutes, another person is being added to that waiting list. So how can we solve this crisis? Clearly, waiting for someone else to donate the organ isn't working. An effective alternative would be fabricating those organs. Using 3D printing and other revolutionary methods, we are on the verge of developing human organs in laboratories. Did you know all the organs in our body generated from a single cell type? These are called the stem cells. So if you want to develop an organ for a patient, extracting his stem cells and converting them to organ-specific cells is the way to go. Suppose the patient needs a new heart. You collected his stem cells, added them to the growing heart, and followed all the protocols to convert them to heart cells. Now, how do you know that the cells are alive deep inside that new heart and if they have converted? You cannot just slice the heart in half to check, right? Because then you don't have an intact heart anymore for the patient. That's where my research comes in. I am developing an artificial intelligence or AI-based approach to check the presence and conversion of stem cells. As long as the cells are alive within the heart, their presence will be captured by a sensor that measures the electrical properties from outside without disturbing the organ. Now knowing that the cells are alive, the next question is, have they converted into heart cells? I observe in each stage of the stem cell conversion, the electrical properties change a bit. This results in change in signal pattern. 
So in our case, the patient stem cells would show one kind of pattern, while the converted heart cells would show a slightly different pattern. It's very difficult for humans to track those changes, but my proposed AI approach detects them with very high accuracy. Just imagine the possibilities it represents. We can control the organ growth precisely while developing multiple organs for multiple patients in parallel. I strongly believe my research finding will play a significant part in ending the organ shortage forever. Thank you.